in the house of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Well, we're just going to invite his presence in here. If you just want to lift your hands with me right now and lift your voice with me, we're going to worship this morning and pray. Jesus, we ask that you would be in with us today, God. We're asking that your presence would be in this place, Lord. We lift up your name. We glorify and we thank you, Jesus, for this day that you have given us. We pray, God, that you would have your way in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah.
with the empty soul we fill. Now there's breakthrough. Now there's freedom in your name. You gave us power and the keys to do the same. Oh, redemption made accusers drop their stones. Showed us mercy with your mighty miracle. With your mighty
what a beautiful song. Beautifully done, too. You guys did a great job with that. You may be seated. A little break here, and there'll be another song. You'll get a chance to worship. And Pastor Kurz is going to deliver a great message this morning. You know, somebody once told me, let's take a poll. Do I really look like Brother Kurz? We may be the, close to the same age, but I don't think we look alike. Just a little humor. But um, we want to celebrate with you today a good report on uh, our IF campaign. And if you're a visitor here this morning with us, we welcome you this morning. We're glad you decided to join us. And um, yes, go ahead. We also have a gift for you. And uh, if you go back at the end of the service into our guest services area, someone will meet you there and they'd be really happy to get acquainted with you and give you your gift. So if you're here for the second time, as our pastor says, you're not a visitor anymore, you're one of us. Just kidding. But uh, it is a good report and I wanted to share with you how much you gave to the IF campaign through 2020. John, if you could put that slide up. You gave a total of $240,524. Yes, let's celebrate that. Our goal was 225. Now, you know how God works? When we think everything is bad, God says it's not. You know, but we have to change our thinking. You know, when we went into the pandemic, and everything was shut down, everything was locked down, and everything was gloomy, and some of us ended up with COVID. I myself had it. But some of us have ended up with it. We thought, is it, how is the church going to do through this time? Look at what God did through you. And that's a testimony. Don't ever forget that. And because of that, because of what you did, we were able to help those that were struggling in our own congregation. We were able to help those people that were struggling put food on their table, pay the utility bills, pay their rent, and pull your brother and sister through a tough time. Isn't that what the church is all about? Yes. And again, it's because of your faithfulness. Not only that, our missionaries that were called back into the United States because they couldn't be in foreign countries, we were able to give special offerings to them. Our evangelists who make their living going from church to church and, and spreading the word, we were able to help them. Our Hope Village in the Philippines, we were able to give a special offering so they could fully secure their compound. All, I could go on and on. New beginnings, we were able to help mothers with special offerings. And when pastor called them and told them we wanted to give them an extra offering, it was just in time because some churches were struggling and they couldn't keep up with their commitments. Do you see how God works? Don't ever take that for granted. Don't ever take that for granted. It's a miracle. And through that, and because of your faithfulness, I know that God is going to bless you because of what you did. I know he will. Now, let's look at our, our goal for 21. John, the next slide, please. Our goal for 21 is $230,000. And for those of you who may not be familiar with what IF is, there's a publication in the back, and it's Faith Initiatives. In our church, we don't do any special fundraisers throughout the year. We, we decided not to do that about five years ago. And we went to just you laying out the needs and uh, with you making pledges at the beginning of the year on what you want to do for the missionaries and for all those endeavors that I just said for benevolence. That's over and above your normal giving. And there's a card in here. If I can get it in here. There's a commitment card in here. And it shows that you can cut the bottom of that off and you can drop it in the baskets by the doors as you leave today. Or you can bring it next week if you pick up a publication today. That's how we do uh, all of our, our giving to all of those various areas. And at our business meeting, I'm going to be able to explain more where everything went. That's a shameless plug for the business meeting on February 7th. You can also text, if you're watching online, you can also text IF to 253-8080. And you'll be able to fill out a card online also. And for our children, now I have a little something here. 
You remember in the publication, there is a, uh, pages 14 and 15 is a kids section. How many of you remember that? Raise your hand. Okay. I got a hold of Pastor Tim's picture. And I know, I know that your children can do better than this. Even I, who am not an artist, could do better than this. So I encourage you to pick up the publication, read the testimonies in there, have your children fill out this uh, picture, drop it in the baskets by Kids Church. This is going to be open all month, so you can do that. And really, I thank you again for your faithfulness, and really pray about what God will lay on your heart that you want to do for this year. And let's go through that 240000 dollar goal just like we did this year. Okay? Amen? Amen. John, the next slide, please. At this time, we're going to dismiss you for Kids Church and the Grow Class. Now, the Grow Class, if you've been baptized in the last, say, three or four months and you haven't been able to be in the Grow Class, we're encouraging you to go in that. It's a four-week course, and it's a great. You get a free workbook, and it's going to be taught this morning, starting this morning on Lessons 1 and 2. And I'll meet you in the foyer, and uh, you want to go up to the grow class, I'll escort you up there. Thank you again for your faithfulness. God bless. Yeah.
delights in our worship. Amen. And he certainly is worthy. So good to be here with you today. And I'm just praying that uh, we would all just open our hearts. We've been blessed by his presence already in the worship service. And uh, I always look forward to hearing God's word. It is the truth that sets people free. And uh, how we need God's word to direct our steps and to illuminate our paths in life. And God will do that for each and every one of us today if we allow him to do it. Praise God. You can be seated. Before I get into the message today, I, uh, I want to offer condolences to several families. Uh, Wanda Buford's sister passed away this last week, and uh, we want to offer our condolences to her. And uh, then Joe and Dee Curry, uh, their son passed this week also, and details on that funeral will be coming up. Uh, you'll probably get an email tomorrow that, that outlines that for you. You know, I've, I've talked to several people. It is so difficult when we lose the people we love. Um, but there are people in the world that attempt to get through those difficult times without God. And I'm just so thankful that when the really tough times come, we have Jesus Christ to be there with us. Praise God. And I know it's, it's still not easy, but uh, I... I I pray that you will continue to pray for the Buford family and for the Currys. Uh, they're going to need the strength of uh, our prayers, our love, and our support uh, in the coming days for certain. So please do that, and I know that you'll be faithful. So I want to get into the message here this morning and uh, just see what God can do to help us. I, I'm, I'm excited about this message. I have been for several weeks preparing it, and uh, I love God's Word. And uh, I know that you do too. So being a disciple of Jesus Christ, uh, really, it involves many responsibilities. Some of them are spiritual. We know that. Things like praying and studying his word and sharing truth with unsaved people and maybe helping people on their journey, uh, new Christians as they grow in Christ. Uh, but there are some other responsibilities, while still spiritual in a nature, they're, they're a bit more practical. Things like training our children and uh, simply attending church like you're doing today, getting involved in a ministry, or maybe being faithful with our finances. 
So that's actually what I want to speak about today, one of those practical topics. I want to speak about being faithful with our finances. And uh, I really want to have God help us understand the true spirit of giving, okay? It's a topic that makes some folks nervous. It's not my intention here today to make you nervous at all. In fact, I want to do the exact opposite. Uh, there are some amazing things that can enter into our heart when we really understand and embrace the spirit of giving, okay? But why does it make some people nervous, uh, especially in a church environment, if we're going to talk about something like money? Uh, well, it's this simple. Most people have a love affair with their money, okay? Um, and that makes it one of the most important issues in the Christian's life, and that also makes it kind of dangerous because we are supposed to have a love affair with Jesus Christ, okay? We are supposed to love him more than anything, certainly more than our money or our finances. Now, one writer said money isn't everything, but it ranks right up there with oxygen. And uh, perhaps you've felt that way at times. Uh, we can be very reluctant to part with our money unless we're totally convinced that it's in our best interest. I mean, you don't buy a car that you don't want. You don't invest in a home if you hate the look of the home, okay? You don't go out and buy a new suit of clothes or a pair of shoes that don't fit. You don't spend your money, and I don't spend mine, on things that I really don't want or sometimes things that I feel I really don't need. But what if we wouldn't be so reluctant with our money? What if we would consider today and in the days to come uh, what is in the best interest of the kingdom of God, okay? So I want to help us put money into a proper perspective, which is a biblical one, all right? I want to share some biblical principles that we all really need to understand. And uh, I've got a lot of scriptures today because I don't want this to be my opinion, okay? I want to prove to you what God's word has to say about uh, really the spirit of giving, and uh, I may actually, this is kind of humorous, I may go a little longer than I normally do. I was in the hallway earlier this morning, and uh, <clears throat> I overheard a conversation going on uh, in our Sunday school department <laughs> where the teachers were being instructed saying, uh, and I just caught this as I was going by, uh, Pastor Kurz is preaching this morning, so everything will be on time. Uh, <laughs> In fact, you know that he's usually shorter than some of the other speakers. <laughs> and so I stuck my head into the office and I said, actually, <laughs> I've got a lot of stuff on the agenda this morning, so maybe tell your teachers that I won't be quite as prompt as I usually am. But I think you'll appreciate that. We're going to look into God's Word, and uh, the Scriptures will come up on the screen. You can see what's, uh, what we're dealing with. So some of those biblical principles, let me start with, no, with number one, really. Money itself is dangerous, okay? Uh, some people have firsthand experience with just how dangerous money is. Uh, it has been proven that money kills brain cells. Every time you lend money to a friend, it damages their memory. Now, the scripture puts it a little differently, talking about the dangers of money. <clears throat> Paul wrote uh, to Timothy, and he said, the love of money is the root of all evil. And, you know, you can trace history. You can look at what's going on in the world. You can look at the lives of people that have a love affair with their money. And there's a lot of evil that flows out of that, okay? That, that's what the scripture says. The love of money is the root of all evil. And, of course, that makes it very dangerous. <clears throat> and Jesus Christ himself gave a warning to his followers when he was walking on this earth, and he said, it's harder for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And, you know, most of us are willing to take the risk because money is so attractive. The second biblical principle is it's not really my money, to which we say, well, then whose is it? I mean, come on, I earned it. It looks like my money. It's in my wallet. It's my name on the checking account. It's my name on that credit card that I use to buy stuff. What do you mean telling me it's not really my money? It's not just me telling you that. The scripture tells us that. So let me give you a few of them. First Chronicles 29, 11. For all that is in heaven and the earth is yours. It's talking about God. All. That includes your money. 
The earth is the Lord's, it says in Psalm 24, 1, and all its fullness. And then in Psalm 50, verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. So really, I think the question becomes, how are you going to handle his money? It's not really how are you going to handle your money. It's not our money. It's his. And, you know, it's not hard to part with something that's not yours. I mean, I'd, I'd give your car away. I'd let somebody move into your house. It's not mine. And no big deal. The truth is, if you think that all your money is really yours, you're in trouble. And you will live a selfish life. And greed will begin to destroy you. Now, you may say, oh, come on, Pastor Kerr, that uh, greed's not going to destroy me. Well, what does the Bible say? Proverbs 119. So are the ways of everyone who is greedy for gain. It takes away the life of its owners. That's a pretty stern warning to us. But people continue to say, listen, I've worked hard for this money. This, this is mine. I get the paycheck every Friday. I work 40, 50, 60 hours a week. I've worked two jobs. I've gone to college. I've gotten an education. I've prepared myself and equipped myself. This is my stuff. But I want you to keep this in mind. Everything that we own, God has either given to us or he's allowed us to obtain it. Now, is that really true? The American mindset would refute that and say, well, that's not really true. I've got these skills. I, you know, I've got this career. I've got these talents. This is my stuff. No, everything we have, God has given to us or allowed us to have. And I can prove that scripturally with the third biblical principle here. <clears throat> God is the provider of all wealth, okay? Deuteronomy 18, or 8, 18. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. You don't have that power and ability in and of yourselves. Remember the Lord. It's he who gives you the power to even get that paycheck on Friday, okay? And in 1 Chronicles 29, 12, both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. Now, here's a truth we need to understand. You, weren't, you won't earn another penny if God doesn't allow it. You've heard me say this about other things. I don't take another breath unless God allows it. My heart doesn't beat another beat unless God allows it. You won't earn another penny unless God allows it. So biblical point number four, we are expected to manage his money wisely. His money. How are we going to do that? You know, there are people that settle in for doing the least required to get by. Uh, the least required to get by in everything, their marriage, their parenting, their finances, their careers, you know, how hard they go to work. You know, that's not the way we can live. There are other people that realize they're just a conduit for God to use, you know, and they will never be able to outgive God. They know that in their heart, and it actually excites them because God will faithfully bless faithful disciples who financially contribute to his work on planet Earth. He will be a debtor to no man. Th this whole big picture isn't about finances. It's not about money. It's about souls. It's about people that God is wanting to reach through his kingdom, but the kingdom doesn't run on peanuts, okay? <clears throat> In our culture, it takes some finances to do that. And so when we faithfully bless God's kingdom and the work he wants us to do, God turns around and blesses us. I don't have time to get into the stories here this morning. Some of you have maybe heard some of mine through the years. God has done miraculous things for me to honor the faithfulness I've been able to bring his way. When I've given sacrificially and gone above and beyond what seemed reasonable, God never, ever, ever has disappointed me. I, I've got an amazing surprise, checks in the mail, you know, within one minute of thinking there was no hope for me anymore. God always comes through. And so he does bless his people. And I think we need to remember that the Bible says in Acts chapter 20, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It is more blessed to give than to receive. I guarantee you there aren't any people grumbling about the $240,000 that went into the faith initiatives to help people around the world. They're thrilled that they had an opportunity to be a part of that. 
And God's blessings always come to those who are willing to give financially to the furtherance of his kingdom. I want to be kingdom-minded. I want to be on the same page that God is on. So let me give you a few more scriptures here about how faithful God is and how his blessings flow into our lives when we simply embrace the spirit of giving. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow little, you reap little. If you sow much, you reap much. That's true in every aspect of our lives, and it certainly applies to our financial contributions. Luke 6, 38, Jesus talking here. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. I, I've always loved this scripture. Give and it'll be given to you. Not just a little bit. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, overflowing. I mean, the barrel is full. And then another one, 1 Corinthians 4, 2. It is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Now, I don't know about you, but the last time I looked in the dictionary, the word required does not mean optional. It is required in stewards that one be found faithful. It's something that God expects us to do. It's not some option. And I'll get into that a little deeper with some alarming statistics. But I want, if we're required to be faithful, let's define what that really means in this context. What, what is it faithful? What's required of a 21st century Christian when it comes to giving? First, answer this question in your own heart. Is God serious about finances? Is God serious about money? Okay? One writer said, and listen carefully to this, to underscore how important the subject of money and possessions is to God, 16 of Christ's 38 parables speak about how people should handle earthly treasure. In fact, and I'm still quoting this author, Jesus taught more about stewardship, one out of every ten verses in the Gospels, than about heaven and hell combined. That's a little surprising, isn't it? There are more than 500 verses in the Bible concerning prayer. There are nearly 500 verses in the Bible concerning faith. But there are more than 2,000 verses on the subject of money and possessions. So, yes, I guess God is serious about our possessions and our finances. But he's not just serious about money. He is serious about the condition of our heart. Okay? That's what it's really all about. Jesus said clearly, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't want my heart in my wallet, okay? I don't want my heart in my checkbook. I don't want my heart in some 401k plan. I don't want my heart in an annuity program, okay? I want my heart to be in the kingdom of God. I'm supposed to love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength. He needs to be first in anything that would get in the way. I mean, there are amusements, there are possessions, there are all kinds of distractions in our world. I don't want money to be a distraction to me that it prevents me from being who God wants me to be. For where my treasure is, that's where my heart really is, okay? So... What is really required? He says it's required in stewards that one be found faithful. What's really required? First, consider the first fruits principle found in God's word. And I know that many of you understand and know about this. I'm going to give you a bunch of scriptures here. <clears throat> Exodus 23, 19. The first of the first fruits of your land you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. This is Moses talking in the Old Testament. The first of the first fruits of your land. You bring into the house of the Lord your God. Why? Well, it's his. It's all his, remember? And, and here, too, the, back then the people could have said, hey, we planted it. We're the ones that put the seed in the ground. We broke our backs doing this. We're the ones that tilled it. We're the ones that dug the weeds out. We're the ones that harvested it. We're storing it in our barns that we built with our own hands. But the scripture says, no, you need to bring the first fruits to the Lord's house. Proverbs 3.9, 
Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. Not some of it, all of it. This principle actually goes back to the very beginning of man's time on planet Earth. Here it is. Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. This is happening when there's only four people alive on planet Earth, okay? Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. So Abel brings the firstborn of his flock, and God respected it. You know what his brother Abel did? He killed him. So I guess maybe he wasn't in favor of the first fruits principle. I don't know what was all involved there. Leviticus 2730, <clears throat> and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed or the fruit of the tree, it's the Lord's and it's holy unto him. Now, 430 years before tithing was a part of the Mosaic law, Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Abraham is our spiritual father. We read about that in the New Testament. Melchizedek, we read about that, is a type of Jesus Christ. And I'll get into what Jesus Christ had to say about tithing in a minute here. But let me go back to one more Old Testament example, Jericho. Because Jericho, the city, was the first city Israel was to conquer in the promised land. God said, bring all the silver and the gold into my house. Now, you know what Achan did, okay? A man named Achan kept the first fruits, and his house was cursed as a result. God's looking at this big picture. You're going to conquer all kinds of heathen lands in the promised land, and I'm going to bless you people with milk and honey that flows like crazy. But the first city you conquer, you give it to me to show me that you understand the spirit of giving. So Achan kept the first fruits. He buried them in his tent, and, of course, he got cursed because of that. So here's my question. Would you like to try to live life with 100% of your income that is cursed or with 90% of your income that is blessed by God? That's a fairly simple question to me, and yet uh, it mystifies me that there are still people that wrestle with that question. Some say, I'll gamble, you know, I need all my money. I'm not giving anything to anybody. I'll run the risk of maybe God cursing me, uh, but I'm keeping 100%. I say, no, you are way better off to live with 90% and be blessed. So if you want God's blessing in your life, you must offer the first fruits of your increase to him. So let's go to the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. <clears throat> God is speaking through the prophet Malachi. And in Malachi 3, 8 and 9, he says, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. And, of course, the people are saying, in what way have we robbed you? We, we didn't break into the temple. We didn't steal anything from you, God. In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. That's what God spoke through the prophet to the people of Israel who were not being faithful in the spirit of giving. <clears throat> See, we should fear robbing God far more than we fear paying tithes and giving sacrificial offerings. So let me give you a quote by J.L. Kraft, the head of the Kraft Cheese Corporation. He was a pretty wealthy man, okay? He gave approximately 25% of his enormous income to Christian causes for most of his life. And he said, the only investment I ever made which has paid consistently increasing dividends is the money I've given to the Lord. And you know what? You know we don't have time here, but there are all kinds of people in this congregation who could say that is absolutely true. The best investments I've ever made are the things I've invested into the kingdom of God, the things that I've been willing to part with because I cared about what God wanted to do and where God was going. J.L. Crafts, not the only one who ever experienced that, I have experienced that. I, I can tell you, I've been doing this for 40-some years, and God has never let me down. 
Listen to God's promise recorded in Malachi. This is Malachi 3.10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And then God says, and try me, or prove me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Okay, this isn't Bob Kerr speaking. God is saying this through the prophet Malachi. God is saying, hey, you don't believe what Kerr's is saying? Try me. Give it a try. Bring the tithes into the storehouse and see if there won't be a blessing so big you can't hardly even receive it. I say don't miss the blessing. Why? We love ourselves. The scripture even tells us that. We take care of ourselves. We're concerned about our health. We're concerned about our well-being. We're concerned about relationships. We're concerned about everything. Why would we not be concerned about a blessing that God has laid out there and says, all you have to do is give up a measly 10% of the 100% that I gave you and allowed you to accumulate, and I'll bless you so much you'll hardly be able to contain it. Why would we say, oh, I'm not interested? I'll just go on robbing God. And again, I, this message is not about a guilt trip, okay? If, if you knew, if you're struggling with this, if, if this is all new to you, and you're going, oh, man, I better check this out. I never heard about this stuff. This is kind of scary. Just trust me that God is faithful. This is in our best interest. So some people say none of this matters today. It was a law in the Old Testament, and it does not apply in the New Testament. Has anybody ever heard that? I certainly have. <clears throat> God began the whole tithing discourse in the sixth chapter of Malachi that I just read from by saying this, I am the Lord, I change not. Okay? I think we all agree that God is unchangeable and that he became a man and visited mankind on earth. So what did God in the flesh, what did Jesus Christ have to say about tithing? Did he say anything? Or is it just some Old Testament ceremonial law that no longer applies to us today in the 21st century? For starters, I think we all agree God is unchangeable. Malachi spoke the truth. I am the Lord, I change not, okay? Jesus Christ, in fact, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So did Jesus have anything to say about tithing? Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. That's what Jesus said. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. So the law, as we know, was inspired by a God who never changes. And the law says a lot about tithing, okay? You can get into a really big Bible study. It's all over the Old Testament. It also says things like, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. You shouldn't curse God's name. So can we arbitrarily choose portions of the law that no longer apply to us when Jesus clearly said he came to fulfill the law and not destroy it? Now, I understand there are some ceremonial laws that only applied to the Old Testament nation of Israel. They're not meant for the New Testament church. But tithing is not a ceremonial law. It is an eternal biblical principle that started way back in the garden and has gone on to today. So <clears throat> there's a great example in the Old Testament that helps us really understand something that maybe is necessary if we're really going to embrace the spirit of giving biblically. It helps us understand how God blesses cheerful and generous givers and how he uses their gifts to bless people and then further his kingdom. That's what this is all about, okay? King Hezekiah questioned the priest regarding the enormous amount of first fruits that were piling up in the temple that the people had brought. It was staggering, okay? Second Chronicles 31.10. And the chief priest said, 
Since the people began to bring the offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat and have plenty left, for the Lord has blessed his people, and what is left is this great abundance. Do you know that great abundance is not the norm in the typical American church today, regardless of what denomination it is? Statistics have shown that on average, Christians only give 1.7% of their income to God. So God's ideal plan is about 8.3% short of what's really needed. So what's the reason for the 1.3%? I suppose some fears involved. Greed might occasionally show up. Selfishness, ignorance, or simple lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. People just don't know what God's Word says about the spirit of giving because they've never read it. So here's a challenging thought. If you want to only embrace what the New Testament teaches about giving, you will have a higher standard than if you were living in the Old Testament. Why is that? Well, tithing is actually the least required of a New Testament believer. In the the Old Testament, believers were obedient to the law. In the New Testament, believers are to be obedient to their heart, and they are challenged to give sacrificially beyond what is the least amount required. Listen again to the Apostle Paul. He's writing to the Corinthians here. He says, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed upon the churches in Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, they were suffering people there, okay, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. They were being liberal in their giving, even though they were going through an extremely difficult time of persecution and hardship. He says, for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift. They wanted to give gifts to help Paul further the kingdom of God, and they did it beyond their ability. Have you ever done that? Have you ever trusted God beyond what you really have? I mean, I remember times when, uh, well, I remember one time I was managing a restaurant many, many years ago in Eau Claire, <clears throat> and uh, one of my workers uh, said, hey, uh, Mr. Kurz, I, I ran out of money and paydays three days away. Uh, you know, could I borrow a few bucks? I rolled my eyes inwardly a little bit. <laughs> I reached in my wallet, and to my dismay, The only thing I had in my wallet was a $50 bill. So I cheerfully gave it to him (laughs) as a gift. I wasn't expecting it to be returned. The Bible talks about that. Give expecting nothing in return. Okay, and that's where some of the blessings flow. Okay, so I'm the restaurant manager. The lunch hour rush is over. Uh, That cook had gone home. There's hardly anybody in the restaurant. I'm walking through... uh, the dining room area, and I look down on the floor. What do you think is laying on the floor in the middle of the dining room? A $50 bill. So I pick it up, big smile on my face. I take it into my office. I lay it on the desk. I think I maybe put it in an envelope, and I hung on to it for about a week to see if any customer or any employee would come back and say, did anyone turn a $50 bill in? You know, nobody did. This was a miraculous gift from God. God's just showing me. And, of course, we've operated in bigger venues than a measly $50 bill, but the principle is the same. You can't outgive God. And, I, you know, I'm not even certain that my attitude was perfectly right that day when I saw my wallet empty except for one $50 bill. It was a, come on, or always a five in there. Why does it have to be a 5 today? So these people in Corinth gave beyond their ability. This was a sacrificial offering that went beyond the tithe, okay? <clears throat> Brother Paquin explained that the giving to faith initiatives, our IF program, 
This is beyond the tithe. It, there's nobody with a gun at your head to do this, but I'd love to see you get blessed. My wife and I give to this every year. There's never, oh, man, do we have to do the if thing again this year? No, I, I want to reach the world. I want to see kids in Tupelo's children's mansion be adopted out to loving Christian families. I want to see our missionaries help. I, I, you know, and we have. We have helped people in this congregation quite a few of them through the COVID thing. We've given people practical things that are helping them on their struggling journey through life right now. But that doesn't happen unless the church is willing to give and embrace the true spirit of giving so that when the needs arise, we can give it. And let me assure you, this, this has never been about, you know, paychecks and everything. This is a big business, if you haven't noticed. We have a huge building and other buildings. We, we pay... Utility bills, electric bills, and gas bills, and, and, you know, the staff can't all work for free. Our secretaries and our clerical people, it costs money to run any operation. You know that. But way beyond the if thing is not about that. Not one penny goes to this church. Ever. Not a penny. We give 100% of that $240,000 was given away. And I've got board members in here shaking their heads. Yes, I'm telling you the truth. This is an opportunity for us to give, and I'm not here preaching this just to promote the if thing, because this is a launch Sunday, but you know what? I, I haven't preached this. I preached this, uh, a similar message here six years ago in January. We haven't touched on this message in six years, okay? But I think we need to be reminded. I want to be part of the blessings of God. So Paul writes further <clears throat> to help the people understand the importance of a proper attitude in giving. And I'm looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> Familiar scripture to many. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. How about we follow the word? I don't want you to give grudgingly. I don't want you to give out of necessity. I don't want you to, to attempt to give because Jesus said it's required that a steward be found faithful. If you cannot be a cheerful giver, then don't give because you'll miss the blessing anyway. When you reluctantly part with something that's yours to bless other people and you wish you hadn't done it, God's not going to pat you on the back and bless you. This only works the way the scripture plays it out for us. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart. So don't follow me. Follow the scripture. And if you can give cheerfully, put the smile on your face, and I guarantee you it'll be there some days and weeks and months and years down the road because you did what you're supposed to do, and God bless us. Our attitude will always open a tremendous door of blessing from God. It's always about our heart. It's always about what we really desire to do. It's never, oh, I have to do this. I get to do this. I get to help God further his kingdom with the money he gave me and allowed me to earn with the talents he put in my brain so that I actually have a job where people respect me. Does this make sense to you? It's our attitude that opens the door of blessing. And it also removes any fears we might have about God's ability and God's desire to meet our future financial needs. You know, our world is on the brink of some very difficult times. I don't, I don't think you uh, uh, could say I've never heard that before. <clears throat> we are going to live in perilous times in the last days. I mean, we're marching toward a one-world uh, uh, cashless society, you know? And, and who knows what it all looks like? I don't know if the money you've got in your pocket is going to be worth anything in a few years from now. Only God knows. But I know I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. I know that God will take care of his people. I know he said he'll never leave us or forsake us. He said no weapon formed against us can prosper, that we're actually more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. Listen, I want to be on God's side in the end. And I do not want fear to rule in my heart. 
I want to say confidently that with God's help, I will be able to give what God requires, and I will be able to give above and beyond that with a cheerful spirit until the day I die, regardless of what's going on in my society. Because if I just hoard my stuff thinking it's really mine, I'm deceiving myself. It's not mine. It's God's. So I want to allow God to remove any fears or apprehensions I might ever have about is it sensible to give to God in the midst of a difficult time? I, listen, I, you all, have, so many of you have great stories to tell. You're not up here. I, you know, but for me, I have given sacrificially when I am really hurting financially. I'll run the risk of embarrassing Brother Jerry McLean, our long-term missionary from Nigeria. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know how many years ago this was. I was struggling for some reason financially. I didn't tell a soul about it. Pride gets in the way. I didn't want anyone to know. And part of it, I just wanted to see if God would, would intervene and do something to help me because I was still being faithful even though I was just about dead broke, okay? I got a check in the mail from Africa, from Nigeria. And I don't know if he even remembers this. A $1,000 check. I was crying out at my mailbox. And I joked about it, and I said to somebody, I said, okay, I got this missionary friend. He's over in Africa eating fried guinea pig guts or something, and he sends me a check for a 1000 bucks, and I live in America. Why did that happen? I don't know. God spoke to his heart, and he wasn't afraid to part with some finances because God laid something on his heart. We need to be that kind of people, Okay. So I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to close here. <clears throat> and I, I say this almost every time I ask people to stand. <clears throat> Don't tune out, okay? The final comments when we try and wrap things up and really put them in perspective and the final challenge from God's Word is always so very important that we really get it in our hearts. We, we have this biblical promise, again, one that many of us understand and know. Where in Matthew chapter 6 it says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything you need will be given to you. I'll, God says, I'll take care of all of it. Now, again, we under, this doesn't mean everything you want, okay? The Rolls Royce is not going to be sitting in your driveway when you get home today because you put a big offering in the if box out there. But everything you need food, clothing, shelter, whatever. God promises when you seek first his kingdom and not your own kingdom, he will take care of everything. So here's my personal challenge related to this, the true spirit of giving, okay? Try it. If you haven't already tried it, try it. And do what Malachi said, speaking for God. <clears throat> Test God. Try him. Prove him. He says he'll bless you. Exercise your faith in a faithful God. Giving is a great way to prove to God that you are a faithful and committed disciple. And who doesn't want to be able to say, that's what I really strive to be. I want to be a faithful, committed disciple. It would be a great way to begin 2021, wouldn't it? Something I'm praying that goes way beyond a New Year's resolution that you try for a week or two. I don't believe we can seriously seek God, that we can come faithfully to church like we did today on a regular basis, that we can sing songs of praise, that we can pray fervent prayers even, and then refuse to do what is required biblically regarding financial stewardship. Committed disciples are willingly faithful with their finances. And not just because Jesus Christ said it was required. Again, I don't want to give because I have to. I don't want to give because it's required. I want to give because I truly have a deep desire to help Jesus Christ further his kingdom. And if that is your desire, I, I believe your heart will open up to this message today and you can come away and say, you know what? I want to line up with that. I want to be part of that. If you come to our annual business meeting on February 7th, there will be numbers on the screen forever. 
proving where every penny in this congregation goes. We have very faithful stewards overseeing what we do here. And you know what? Why has God blessed? Why in the midst of a pandemic have we had a surplus of funds to give to people who are hurting? Why have we seen this congregation be able to give beyond what looks sensible even? Because of the spirit of giving, because of faithfulness, because people have believed the message of God's word and they've embraced it. And I don't hear people moaning about, you know, I have to help somebody. I, get, I know so many people in this congregation that, you know, if you would just say, boy, I'm in a tough spot here. What can I do to help? That spirit is alive here, and I'm very thankful for it. So I'm not here. I'm not rebuking people, challenging people in any way. Uh, you know, perhaps this message wasn't even needed because everybody is 100% on board with the spirit of giving, but uh, maybe some of our newer folks have not really ever looked into these scriptures, never read the book of Malachi, don't know what Jesus said. I'm pleased that I can share with you the beauty of the spirit of giving so that you can continue and really begin, maybe for the first time, to be blessed beyond what you've ever perceived possible. And I promise you that if you are faithful, God will be faithful. Praise God. So we are going to dismiss, but we're gonna open this altar for prayer. I know a lot of you these days stay and pray at your pews, and that's fine. You can connect with God there. But if there's anything that I've said that has rattled you a little bit or frustrated you or confused you, would you please spend some time before you leave and just say, God, is what he told me true? Is that true about the spirit of giving? Did he quote the scriptures right? Would you like me to be a willing participant in helping you further your kingdom through the finances you have blessed me with? And if that's so, just help me to be teachable, help me to be open, and help me to be a cheerful giver. God bless you.
in the goodness.